Life of Mind Part 16 In the following winter, our circle, thanks to the assiduity of Hiller, was considerably widened, and it now became a sort of club whose object was to meet freely every week in a room at Engeles Restaurant at the Postplatz. Just about this time the famous J. Schnorr of Munich was appointed director of the museums in Dresden, and we entertained him at a banquet. I had already seen some of his large and well-executed cartoons, which made a deep impression on me, not only on account of their dimensions, but also by reason of the events they depicted from old German history, in which I was at that time particularly interested. It was through Schnorr that I now became acquainted with the Munich school of which he was the master. My heart overflowed when I thought what it meant for Dresden, if such giants of German art were to shake hands there. I was much struck by Schnorr's appearance and conversation, and I could not reconcile his whining pedagogic manner with his mighty cartoons. However, I thought it a great stroke of luck when he also took to frequenting Engeles restaurant on Saturdays. He was well versed in the old German legends, and I was delighted when they formed the topic of conversation. The famous sculptor, H. Nell, used also to attend these meetings, and his marvelous talent inspired me with the greatest respect although I was not an authority on his work, and could only judge of it by my own feelings. I soon saw that his bearing and manner were affected. He was very fond of expressing his opinion and judgment on questions of art, and I was not in a position to decide whether they were reliable or otherwise. In fact, it often occurred to me that I was listening to a Philistine swaggerer. It was only when my old friend Pecht, who had also settled in Dresden for a time, clearly and emphatically explained to me H. Nella standing as an artist, that I conquered all my secret doubts and tried to find some pleasure in his works. Rachel, who was also a member of our society, was the very antithesis of H. Nell. I often found it difficult to believe that the pale, delicate man, with the whining, nervous way of expressing himself, was really a sculptor, but as similar peculiarities in Schnorr did not prevent me from recognizing him as a marvelous painter, this helped me to make friends with Rachel, as he was quite free from affectation and had a warm, sympathetic soul that drew me ever closer to him. I also remember hearing from him a very enthusiastic appreciation of my personality as a conductor. In spite, however, of being fellow members of our versatile art club, we never attained a footing of real comradeship for, after all, no one thought much of anybody else's talents. For instance, Hiller had arranged some orchestral concerts, and to commemorate them he was entertained at the usual banquet by his friends, when his services were gratefully acknowledged with due rhetorical pathos. Yet I never found, in my private intercourse with Hiller's friends, the least enthusiasm in regard to his work. On the contrary, I only noticed expressions of doubt and apprehensive shrugs. These faded concerts soon came to an end. At our social evenings, we never discussed the works of the masters who were present. They were not even mentioned, and it was soon evident that none of the members knew what to talk about. Semper was the only man who, in his extraordinary fashion, often so enlivened our entertainments that Rachel, inwardly sympathetic, though painfully startled, 
would heartily complain against the unrestrained outbursts that led not infrequently to hot discussions between Semper and myself. Strange to say, we two always seemed to start from the hypothesis that we were antagonists, for he insisted upon regarding me as the representative of medieval Catholicism, which he often attacked with real fury. I eventually succeeded in persuading him that my studies and inclinations had always led me to German antiquity and to the discovery of ideals in the early Teutonic myths. When we came to paganism and I expressed my enthusiasm for the genuine heathen legends, he became quite a different being and a deep and growing interest now began to unite us in such a way that it quite isolated us from the rest of the company. It was, however, impossible ever to settle anything without a heated argument, not only because Semper had a peculiar habit of contradicting everything flatly, but also because he knew his views were opposed to those of the entire company. His paradoxical assertions, which were apparently only intended to stir up strife, soon made me realize, beyond any doubt, that he was the only one present who was passionately in earnest about everything he said, whereas all the others were quite content to let the matter drop when convenient. A man of the latter type was Gutzko, who was often with us. He had been summoned to Dresden by the general management of our court theater to act in the capacity of dramatist and adapter of plays. Several of his pieces had recently met with great success. Zopf Uendi Schwert, Das Erbel de Tartuffe and Uriel Acosta shed an unexpected luster on the latest dramatic repertoire, and it seemed as though the advent of Gutzko would inaugurate a new era of glory for the Dresden Theatre, where my operas had also been first produced. The good intentions of the management were certainly undeniable. My only regret on that occasion was that the hopes my old friend Lobby entertained of being summoned to Dresden to fill that post were unrealized. He also had thrown himself enthusiastically into the work of dramatic literature. Even in Paris, I had noticed the eagerness with which he used to study the technique of dramatic composition, especially that of scribe, in the hope of acquiring the skill of that writer, without which, as he soon discovered, no poetical drama in German could be successful. He maintained that he had thoroughly mastered this style in his comedy, Rococo, and he cherished the conviction that he could work up any imaginable material into an effective stage play. At the same time, he was very careful to show equal skill in the selection of his material. In my opinion, this theory of his was a complete failure, as his only successful pieces were those in which popular interest was excited by catchphrases. This interest was always more or less associated with the politics of the day and generally involved some obvious diatribes about German unity and German liberalism. But as this important stimulus was first applied by way of experiment to the subscribers to our residence theater and afterwards to the German public generally, it had, as I have already said, to be worked out with the consummate skill which, presumably, could only be learned from modern French writers of comic opera. I was very glad to see the result of this study in Lobby's plays, more especially as when he visited us in Dresden, which he often did on the occasion of a new production, he admitted his indebtedness with modest candor, 
and was far from pretending to be a real poet. Moreover, he displayed great skill and an almost fiery zeal, not only in the preparation of his pieces, but also in their production, so that the offer of a post at Dresden, the hope of which had been held out to him, would at least, from a practical point of view, have been a benefit to the theater. Finally, however, the choice fell on his rival Gutzko, in spite of his obvious unsuitability for the practical work of dramatist. It was evident that, even as regards his successful plays, his triumph was mainly due to his literary skill, because these effective plays were immediately followed by wearisome productions which made us realize, to our astonishment, that he himself could not have been aware of the skill he had previously displayed. It was, however, precisely these abstract qualities of the genuine man of letters which, in the eyes of many, cast over him the halo of literary greatness, and when Altisho, thinking more of a showy reputation than of permanent benefit to his theater, decided to give the preference to Gutzko, he thought his choice would give a special impetus to the cause of higher culture. To me, the appointment of Gutzko as the director of dramatic art at the theater was peculiarly objectionable, as it was not long before I was convinced of his utter incompetence for the task, and it was probably owing to the frankness with which I expressed my opinion to Alta show that our subsequent estrangement was originally due. I had to complain bitterly of the want of judgment and the levity of those who so recklessly selected men to fill the posts of managers and conductors in such precious institutions of art as the German royal theaters. To obviate the failure I felt convinced must follow on this important appointment, I made a special request that Gutzko should not be allowed to interfere in the management of the opera. He readily yielded, and thus spared himself great humiliation. This action, however, created a feeling of mistrust between us, though I was quite ready to remove this as far as possible by coming into personal contact with him whenever opportunity offered on those evenings when the artists used to gather at the club, as already described. I would gladly have made this strange man, whose head was anxiously bowed down on his breast, relax and unburden himself in his conversations with me, but I was unsuccessful on account of his constant reserve and suspicion and his studied aloofness. An opportunity arose for a discussion between us when he wanted the orchestra to take a melodramatic part, which they afterwards did, in a certain scene of his Oriella Costa, where the hero had to recant his alleged heresy. The orchestra had to execute the soft tremolo for a given time on certain chords, but when I heard the performance it appeared to me absurd, and equally derogatory both for the music and the drama. On one of these evenings I tried to come to an understanding with Gutzko concerning this, and the employment of music generally as a melodramatic auxiliary to the drama, and I discussed my views on the subject in accordance with the highest principles I had conceived. He met all the chief points of my discussion with a nervous, distrustful silence, but finally explained that I really went too far in the significance which I claimed for music, and that he failed to understand how music would be degraded if it were applied more sparingly to the drama, seeing that the claims of verse were often treated with much less respect when it was used as a mere accessory to operatic music. To put it practically, in fact, 
It would be advisable for the librettist not to be too dainty in this matter. It wasn't he possible always to give the actor a brilliant exit. At the same time, however, nothing could be more painful than when the chief performer made his exit without any applause. In such cases, a little distracting noise in the orchestra really supplied a happy diversion. This I actually heard Gutzko say. Moreover, I saw that he really meant it. After this, I felt I had done with him. It was not long before I had equally little to do with all the painters, musicians, and other zealots in art belonging to our society. At the same time, however, I came into closer contact with Berth Old Auerbach. With great enthusiasm, Alwine from Man had already drawn my attention to Auerbach's pastoral stories. The account she gave of these modest works, for that is how she characterized them, sounded quite attractive. She said that they had had the same refreshing effect on her circle of friends in Berlin as that produced by opening the window of a scented boudoir, to which she compared the literature they had hitherto been used to, and letting in the fresh air of the woods. After that I read the pastoral stories of the Black Forest, which had so quickly become famous, and I, too, was strongly attracted by the contents and tone of these realistic anecdotes about the life of the people in a locality which it was easy enough to identify from the vivid descriptions. As at this time Dresden seemed to be becoming ever more and more the rendezvous for the lights of our literary and artistic world, Auerbach also reconciled himself to taking up his quarters in this city, and for quite a long time lived with his friend Hiller, who thus again had a celebrity at his side of equal standing with himself. The short, Sturdy Jewish peasant boy, as he was placed to represent himself to be, made a very agreeable impression. It was only later that I understood the significance of his green jacket and, above all, of his green hunting cap, which made him look exactly what the author of Swabian pastoral stories ought to look like, and this significance was anything but a naive one. The Swiss poet, Gottfried Keller, once told me that, when Auerbach was in Zierich, and he had decided on taking him up, he, Auerbach, had drawn his attention to the best way in which to introduce one's literary effusions to the public and to make money, and he advised him, above all things, to get a coat and cap like his own, for being, as he said, like himself, neither handsome nor well-grown. It would be far better deliberately to make himself look rough and queer. So saying, he placed his cap on his head in such a way as to look a little rakish. For the time being, I perceived no real affectation in Auerbach, he had assimilated so much of the tone and ways of the people, and had done this so happily, that, in any case, one could not help asking oneself why, with these delightful qualities, he should move with such tremendous ease in spheres that seemed absolutely antagonistic. At all events, he always seemed in his true element even in those circles which really seemed most opposed to his assumed character. There he stood in his green coat, keen, sensitive, and natural, surrounded by the distinguished society that flattered him, and he loved to show letters he had received from the Grand Duke of Weimar and his answers to them all the time looking at things from the standpoint of the Swabian peasant nature, which suited him so admirably. 
What especially attracted me to him was the fact that he was the first Jew I ever met with whom one could discuss Judaism with absolute freedom. He even seemed particularly desirous of removing, in his agreeable manner, all prejudice on this score, and it was really touching to hear him speak of his boyhood and declare that he was perhaps the only German who had read Klopstock as Messiah all through. Having one day become absorbed in this work, which he read secretly in his cottage home, he had played the truant from school, and when he finally arrived too late at the schoolhouse, his teacher angrily exclaimed, You confounded Jew boy, where have you been? Lending money again, such experiences had only made him feel pensive and melancholy, but not bitter, and he had even been inspired with real compassion for the coarseness of his tormentors. These were traits in his character which drew me very strongly to him. As time went on, however, it seemed to me a serious matter that he could not get away from the atmosphere of these ideas, for I began to feel that the universe contained no other problem for him than the elucidation of the Jewish question. One day, therefore, I protested as good-naturedly and confidentially as I could, and advised him to let the whole problem of Judaism drop as there were, after all, many other standpoints from which the world might be criticized. Strange to say, he thereupon not only lost his ingenuousness, but also fell to whining in an ecstatic fashion, which did not seem to me very genuine, and assured me that that would be an impossibility for him, as there was still so much in Judaism which needed his whole sympathy. I could not help recalling the surprising anguish which he had manifested on this occasion when I learned, in the course of time, that he had repeatedly arranged Jewish marriages, concerning the happy result of which I heard nothing, save that he had, by this means, made quite a fortune. When, several years afterwards, I again saw him in Zirich, I observed that his appearance had unfortunately changed in a manner quite disconcerting. He looked really extraordinarily common and dirty. His former refreshing liveliness had turned into the usual Jewish restlessness, and it was easy to see that all he said was uttered as if he regretted that his words could not be turned to better account in a newspaper article. During his time in Dresden, however, Auerbach's warm agreement with my artistic projects really did me good, even though it may have been only from his Semitic and Swabian standpoint, so did the novelty of the experience I was at that time undergoing as an artist, in meeting with ever-increasing regard and recognition among people of note, of acknowledged importance, and of exceptional culture. If, after the success obtained by Rienzi, I still remained with the circle of the real theatrical world. The greater success following on Tanuser certainly brought me into contact with such people, as I have mentioned above, who, though to be sure they considerably enlarged my ideas, at the same time impressed me very unfavorably with what was apparently the pinnacle of the artistic life of the period. At any rate, I felt neither rewarded nor, fortunately, even diverted by the acquaintances I won by the first performance of my tan user that winter. On the contrary, I felt an irresistible desire to withdraw into my shell and leave these gay surroundings into which, strangely enough, I had been introduced at the instigation of Hiller, whom I soon recognized as being a non-entity. 
I felt I must quickly compose something, as this was the only means of ridding myself of all the disturbing and painful excitement Tan User had produced in me. Only a few weeks after the first performances, I had worked out the whole of the Lohengrin text. In November, I had already read this poem to my intimate friends and soon afterwards to the Hiller set. It was praised and pronounced effective. Schumann also thoroughly approved of it, although he did not understand the musical form in which I wished to carry it out, as he saw no resemblance in it to the old methods of writing individual solos for the various artists. I then had some fun in reading different parts of my work to him in the form of arias and cavatinas, after which he laughingly declared himself satisfied. Serious reflection, however, aroused my gravest doubts as to the tragic character of the material itself, and to these doubts I had been led, in a manner both sensible and tactful, by Frank. He thought it offensive to effect LCS punishment through Lohengrin's departure, for although he understood that the characteristics of the legend were expressed precisely by this highly poetical feature, he was doubtful as to whether it did full justice to the demands of tragic feeling in its relation to dramatic realism. He would have preferred to see Lohengrin die before our eyes owing to LCS loving treachery. As, however, this did not seem feasible, he would have liked to see Lohengrin spellbound by some powerful motive and prevented from getting away. Although, of course, I would not agree to any of these suggestions, I went so far as to consider whether I could not do away with the cruel separation and still retain the incident of Lohengrin's departure, which was essential. I then sought for a means of letting Elsa go away with Lohengrin as a form of penance which would withdraw her also from the world. This seemed more promising to my talented friend. While I was still very doubtful about all this, I gave my poem to Frau von Eltischow so that she might peruse it and criticize the point raised by Frank. In a little letter, in which she expressed her pleasure at my poem, she wrote briefly, but very decidedly, on the naughty question and declared that Frank must be devoid of all poetry if he did not understand that it was exactly in the way I had chosen, and in no other, that Lohengrin must depart. I felt as if a load had fallen from my heart. In triumph I showed the letter to Frank, who, much abashed and by way of excusing himself, opened a correspondence with Frau von Eltischow, which certainly cannot have been lacking in interest, though I was never able to see any of it. In any case, the upshot of it was that Lohengrin remained as I had originally conceived it. Curiously enough, some time later, I had a similar experience with regard to the same subject, which again put me in a temporary state of uncertainty. When Adolf Starr gravely raised the same objection to the solution of the Lohengrin question, I was really taken aback by the uniformity of opinion, and as, owing to some excitement, I was just then no longer in the same mood as when I composed Lohengrin, I was foolish enough to write a hurried letter to Star in which, with but a few slight reservations, I declared him to be right. I did not know that, by this, I was causing real grief to List, who was now in the same position with regard to Star as Frau von Eltischow had been with regard to Frank. Fortunately, however, 
The displeasure of my great friend at my supposed treachery to myself did not last long, for, without having got wind of the trouble I had caused him, and thanks to the torture I myself was going through, I came to the proper decision in a few days, and, as clear as daylight, I saw what madness it had been. I was therefore able to rejoice list with the following laconical protest which I sent him from my Swiss resort, Star is wrong, and Lohengrin is right. For the present I remained occupied with the revision of my poem, for there could be no question of planning the music to it just now. That peaceful and harmonious state of mind which is so favorable to creative work, and always so necessary to me for composing, I now had to secure with the greatest difficulty, for it was one of the things I always had the hardest struggle to obtain. All the experiences connected with the performance of Tanuser having filled me with true despair as to the whole future of my artistic operations, I saw it was hopeless to think of its production being extended to other German theaters, for I had not been able to achieve this end even with the successful Rienzi. It was perfectly obvious, therefore, that my work would, at the utmost, be conceded a permanent place in the Dresden repertoire. As the result of all this, my pecuniary affairs, which have already been described, had got into such a serious state that a catastrophe seemed inevitable. While I was preparing to meet this in the best way I could, I tried to stupefy myself, on the one hand, by plunging into the study of history, mythology, and literature, which were becoming ever dearer and dearer to me, and on the other by working incessantly at my artistic enterprises. As regards the former, I was chiefly interested in the German Middle Ages and tried to make myself familiar with every point relative to this period. Although I could not set about this task with philological precision, I proceeded with such earnestness that I studied the German records, published by Grimm, for instance, with the greatest interest. As I could not put the results of such studies immediately into my scenes, there were many who could not understand why, as an operatic composer, I should waste my time on such barren work. Different people remarked later on that the personality of Lohengrin had a charm quite its own, but this was ascribed to the happy selection of the subject, and I was specially praised for choosing it. Material from the German Middle Ages, and later on, subjects from Scandinavian antiquity, were therefore looked forward to by many, and, in the end, they were astonished that I gave them no adequate result of all my labors. Perhaps it will be of help to them if I now tell them to take the old records and such works to their aid. I forgot at that time to call Hilleras' attention to my documents, and with great pride he seized upon a subject out of the history of the Hohenstaufen. As, however, he had no success with his work, he may perhaps think I was a little artful for not having spoken to him of the old records. Concerning my other duties, my chief undertaking for this winter consisted in an exceptionally carefully prepared performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which took place in the spring on Palm Sunday. This performance involved many a struggle, besides a host of experiences which were destined to exercise a strong influence over my further development. Roughly, they were as follows. 
The Royal Orchestra had only one opportunity a year of showing their powers independently in a musical performance outside the opera or the church. For the benefit of the pension fund for their widows and orphans, the old so-called opera house was given up to a big performance originally only intended for oratorios. Ultimately, in order to make it more attractive, a symphony was always added to the oratorio, and as already mentioned, I had performed on such occasions, once the pastoral symphony and later Haydn's creation. The latter was a great joy to me, and it was on this occasion that I first made its acquaintance. As we two conductors had stipulated for alternate performances, the symphony on Palm Sunday of the year 1846 fell to my lot. I had a great longing for the Ninth Symphony, and I was led to the choice of this work by the fact that it was almost unknown in Dresden. When the directors of the orchestra, who were the trustees of the pension fund, and who had to promote its increase, got to know of this. Such a fright seized them that they interviewed the general director, Altisho, and begged him, by virtue of his high authority, to dissuade me from carrying out my intention. They gave as a reason for this request that the pension fund would surely suffer through the choice of this symphony, as the work was in ill repute in the place, and would certainly keep people from going to the concert. The symphony had been performed many years before by Reisiger at a charity concert, and, as the conductor himself honestly admitted, had been an absolute failure. Now it needed my whole ardor, and all the eloquence I could command, to prevail over the doubts of our principal. With the orchestral directors, however, there was nothing for me to do but quarrel, as I heard that they were complaining all over the town about my indiscretion. In order to add shame to their trouble, I made up my mind to prepare the public in such a way for the performance, upon which I had resolved, and for the work itself, that at least the sensation caused would lead to a full hall and thus, in a very favorable manner, guarantee satisfactory returns and contradict their belief that the fund was menaced. Thus the Ninth Symphony had, in every conceivable way, become for me a point of honor for the success of which I had to exercise all my powers to the utmost. The committee had misgivings regarding the outlay needed for procuring the orchestral parts, so I borrowed them from the Leipzig Concert Society. Imagine my feelings, however, on now seeing for the first time since my earliest boyhood the mysterious pages of this score, which I studied conscientiously. In those days the sight of these same pages had filled me with the most mystic reveries, and I had stayed up for nights together to copy them out. Just as at the time of my uncertainty in Paris, on hearing the rehearsal of the first three movements performed by the incomparable orchestra of the Conservatoire, I had been carried back through years of error and doubt to be placed in marvelous touch with my earliest days, while all my inmost aspirations had been fruitfully stimulated in a new direction. So now in the same way the memory of that music was secretly awakened in me as I again saw before my own eyes that which in those early. Days had likewise been only a mysterious vision. I had by this time experienced much which, in the depths of my soul, drove me almost unconsciously to a process of summing up, to an almost despairing inquiry concerning my fate. 
What I dared not acknowledge to myself was the fact of the absolute insecurity of my existence both from the artistic and financial point of view, for I saw that I was a stranger to my own mode of life as well as to my profession, and I had no prospects whatsoever. This despair, which I tried to conceal from my friends, was now converted into genuine exultation, thanks entirely to the Ninth Symphony. It is not likely that the heart of a disciple has ever been filled with such keen rapture over the work of a master as mine was at the first movement of this symphony. If anyone had come upon me unexpectedly while I had the open score before me, and had seen me convulsed with sobs and tears as I went through the work in order to consider the best manner of rendering it, he would certainly have asked with astonishment if this were really fitting behavior for the conductor royal of Saxony. Fortunately, on such occasions I was spared the visits of our orchestra directors and their worthy conductor Reisiga, and even those of F. Hiller, who was so versed in classical music. In the first place I drew up a program, for which the book of words for the chorus always ordered according to custom furnished me with a good pretext. I did this in order to provide a guide to the simple understanding of the work, and thereby hoped to appeal not to the critical judgment, but solely to the feelings of the audience. This program, in the framing of which some of the chief passages in Goethe's Faust were exceedingly helpful to me, was very well received, not only on that occasion in Dresden, but later on in other places. Besides this, I made use of the Dresden Anziger, by writing all kinds of short and enthusiastic anonymous paragraphs in order to whet the public taste for a work which hitherto had been in ill repute in Dresden. Not only did these purely extraneous exertions succeed in making the receipts of that year by far exceed any that had been taken there before, but the orchestra directors themselves, during the remaining years of my stay in Dresden, made a point of ensuring similarly large profits by repeated performances of the celebrated symphony. Concerning the artistic side of the performance, I aimed at making the orchestra give as expressive a rendering as possible, and to this end made all kinds of notes, myself, in the various parts, so as to make quite sure that their interpretation would be as clear and as colored as could be desired. It was principally the custom which existed then of doubling the wind instruments that led me to a most careful consideration of the advantages this system presented, for, in performances on a large scale, the following somewhat crude rule prevailed, all those passages marked piano were executed by a single set of instruments, while those marked forte were carried out by a duplicated set. As an instance of the way in which I took care to ensure an intelligible rendering by this means, I might point to a certain passage in the second movement of the symphony, where the whole of the string instruments play the principal and rhythmical figure in C major for the first time. It is written in triple octaves, which play uninterruptedly in unison and, to a certain degree, serve as an accompaniment to the second theme, which is only performed by feeble wood instruments. As fortissimo is indicated alike for the whole orchestra, the result in every imaginable rendering must be that the melody for the wood instruments not only completely disappears, but cannot even be heard through the strings, which, after all, are only accompanying.
Now, as I never carried my piety to the extent of taking directions absolutely literally, rather than sacrifice the effect really intended by the master to the erroneous indications given, I made the strings play only moderately loudly instead of real fortissimo, up to the point where they alternate with the wind instruments in taking up the continuation of the new theme, thus the motive. Rendered as it was as loudly as possible by a double set of wind instruments, was, I believe for the first, time since the existence of the symphony, heard with real distinctness. I proceeded in this manner throughout, in order to guarantee the greatest exactitude in the dynamical effects of the orchestra. There was nothing, however difficult, which was allowed to be performed in such a way as not to arouse the feelings of the audience in a particular manner. For example, many brains had been puzzled by the fugato in six-eighths time which comes after the chorus, for a wiesane sonnenfliegen, in the movement of the finale marked alia marcia. In view of the preceding inspiriting verses, which seemed to be preparing for combat and victory, I conceived this fugato really as a glad but earnest war song, and I took it at a continuously fiery tempo and with the utmost vigor. The day following the first performance, I had the satisfaction of receiving a visit from the musical director Anneker of Freiburg, who came to tell me somewhat penitently that though until then he had been one of my antagonists, since the performance of the symphony he certainly reckoned himself among my friends. What had absolutely overwhelmed him, he said, was precisely my conception and interpretation of the fugato. Furthermore, I devoted special attention to that extraordinary passage, resembling a recitative for the cellos and basses, which comes at the beginning of the last movement, and which had once caused my old friend Pollens such great humiliation in Leipzig. Thanks to the exceptional excellence of our bass players, I felt certain of attaining to absolute perfection in this passage. After twelve, Special rehearsals of the instruments alone concerned, I succeeded in getting them to perform in a way which sounded not only perfectly free, but which also expressed the most exquisite tenderness and the greatest energy in a thoroughly impressive manner. From the very beginning of my undertaking I had at once recognized that the only method of achieving overwhelming popular success with this symphony was to overcome, by some ideal means, the extraordinary difficulties presented by the choral parts. I realized that the demands made by these parts could be met only by a large and enthusiastic body of singers. It was above all necessary, then, to secure a very good and large choir. So, besides adding the somewhat feeble Dreisig Academy of singing to our usual number of members in the theater chorus, in spite of great difficulties, I also enlisted the help of the choir from the Kreuzschul, with its fine boys' voices, and the choir of the Dresden Seminary, which had had much practice in church singing. In a way quite my own, I now tried to get these three hundred singers, who were frequently united for rehearsals, into a state of genuine ecstasy. For instance, I succeeded in demonstrating to the basses that the celebrated passage side Umschlungen, Millionen, and especially Bruder, Uberem Sternenzelt mus Eien Guter Fadawonen, could not be sung in an ordinary manner, but must, as it were, be proclaimed with the greatest rapture.
In this, I took the lead in a manner so elated that I really think I literally transported them to a world of emotion utterly strange to them for a while, and I did not desist till my voice, which had been heard clearly above all the others, began to be no longer distinguishable even to myself, but was drowned, so to speak, in the warm sea of sound. It gave me particular pleasure, with Mitterwurzeres cooperation, to give a most overwhelmingly expressive rendering of the recitative for baritone, Freund, nicked D's tone. In view of its exceptional difficulties, this passage might almost be considered impossible to perform, and yet he executed it in a way which showed what fruit our mutual interchange of ideas had borne. I also took care that, by means of the complete reconstruction of the hall, I should obtain good acoustic conditions for the orchestra, which I had arranged according to quite a new system of my own. As may be imagined, it was only with the greatest difficulty that the money for this could be found. However, I did not give up, and owing to a totally new construction of the platform, I was able to concentrate the whole of the orchestra towards the center and surround it, in amphitheater fashion, by the throng of singers who were accommodated on seats very considerably raised. This was not only of great advantage to the powerful effect of the choir, but it also gave great precision and energy to the finely organized orchestra in the purely symphonic movements. Even at the general rehearsal, the hall was overcrowded. Reisiger was guilty of the incredible stupidity of working up the public mind against the symphony and drawing attention to Beethoven's very regrettable error. Gade, on the other hand, who came to visit us from Leipzig, where he was then conducting the Gewandhaus concerts, assured me after the general rehearsal, that he would willingly have paid double the price of his ticket in order to hear the recitative by the basses once more, whilst Hiller considered that I had gone too far in my modification of the tempo. What he meant by this I learned subsequently when I heard him conducting intricate orchestral works, but of this I shall have more to say later on. There was no denying that the performance was, on the whole, a success. In fact, it exceeded all our expectations and was particularly well received by the non-musical public. Among these I remember the philologist Dr. Coakley, who came to me at the end of the evening and confessed that it was the first time he had been able to follow a symphonic work from beginning to end with intelligent interest. This experience left me with a pleasant feeling of ability and power, and strongly confirmed me in the belief that if I only desired anything with sufficient earnestness, I was able to achieve it with irresistible and overwhelming success. I now had to consider, however, what the difficulties were which hitherto had prevented a similarly happy production of my own new conceptions. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which was still such a problem to so many, and had, at all events, never attained to popularity, I had been able to make a complete success, yet, as often as it was put on the stage, my tan user taught me that the possibilities of its success had yet to be discovered. How is this to be done? This was and remained the secret question which influenced all my subsequent development. I dared not, however, indulge at that time in any meditation on this point with the view of arriving at any particular results for the real significance of my failure, 
of which I was inwardly convinced, stood absolutely bare before me with all its terrifying lessons. Albeit, I could no longer delay taking even the most disagreeable steps with the view of warding off the catastrophe which menaced my financial position. I was led to this thanks to the influence of a ridiculous omen. My agent, the purely nominal publisher of my three operas Rienzi, the Fliegender Hollander, and Tanuser the eccentric court music publisher, C. F. Messier, invited me one day to the café known as the Vertebrer to discuss our money affairs. With great qualms we talked over the possible results of the annual Easter fair and wondered whether they would be tolerably good or altogether bad. I gave him courage and ordered a bottle of the best Ozzo turn. A venerable flask made its appearance. I filled the glasses, and we drank to the good success of the fair, when suddenly we both yelled as though we had gone mad, while, with horror, we tried to rid our mouths of the strong tarragon vinegar with which we had been served by mistake. Heavens, cried Messier, nothing could be worse. True enough, I answered. No doubt there is much that will turn to vinegar for us. My good humor revealed to me in a flash that I must try some other way of saving myself than by means of the Easter fair. Not only was it necessary to refund the capital which had been got together by dint of ever-increasing sacrifices, in order to defray the expenses of the publication of my operas. But, owing to the fact that I had been obliged ultimately to seek aid from the usurers, the rumor of my debts had spread so far abroad that even those friends who had helped me at the time of my arrival in Dresden were seized with anxiety on my account. At this time I met with a really sad experience at the hands of Madame Schroeder de Vriant, who, as the result of her incomprehensible lack of discretion, did much to bring about my final undoing. When I first settled in Dresden, as I have already pointed out, she lent me three thousand marks, not only to help me to discharge my debts, but also to allow me to contribute to the maintenance of my old friend Keats in Paris. Jealousy of my niece Johanna and suspicion that I had made her, my niece, come to Dresden in order to make it easier for the general management to dispense with the services of the great artist, had awakened in this otherwise so noble-minded woman the usual feelings of animosity towards me, which are so often met with in the theatrical profession. She had now given up her engagement. She even declared openly that I had been partly instrumental in obtaining her dismissal and abandoning all friendly regard for me, whereby she deeply wronged me in every respect. She placed the IOU. I had given her in the hands of an energetic lawyer, and without further ado this man sued me for the payment of the money. Thus I was forced to make a clean breast of everything to Altisho, and to beseech him to intervene for me, and if possible to obtain a royal advance that would enable me to clear my position, which was so seriously compromised. My principal declared himself willing to support any request I might wish to address to the king on this matter. To this end I had to note down the amount of my debts, but as I soon discovered that the necessary sum could only be assigned to me as a loan from the theater pension fund, at an interest of 5%, and that I should moreover have to secure the capital of the pension fund by a life insurance policy, which would cost me annually 3% of the capital borrowed, 
I was, for obvious reasons, tempted to leave out of my petition all those of my debts which were not of oppressing nature, and for the payment of which I thought I could count on the receipts which I might finally expect from my publishing enterprises. Nevertheless, the sacrifices I had to make in order to repay the help offered me increased to such an extent that my salary of conductor, in itself very slender, promised to be materially diminished for some time to come. I was forced to make the most irksome efforts to gather together the necessary sum for the life insurance policy and was therefore obliged frequently to appeal to Leipzig. In addition to this, I had to overcome the most appalling doubts in regard both to my health and to the probable length of my life, concerning which I fancied I had heard all sorts of malicious apprehensions expressed by those who had observed me but casually in the miserable condition which I was in at that time. My friend Pisanelli, as a doctor who was very intimate with me, eventually managed to give such satisfactory information concerning the state of my health that I succeeded in insuring my life at the rate of 3%. The last of these painful journeys to Leipzig was, at all events, made under pleasant circumstances owing to a kind invitation from the old maestro Louis Spar. I was particularly pleased over this, because to me it meant nothing less than an act of reconciliation. As a matter of fact, Spar had written to me on one occasion and had declared that, stimulated by the success of my Fliegender Hollander and his own enjoyment of it, he had once more decided to take up the career of a dramatic composer, which of recent years had brought him such scant success. His last work was an opera die cruise fairer which he had sent to the Dresden Theatre in the course of the preceding year in the hope, as he himself assured me, that I would urge on its production. After asking this favor, he drew my attention to the fact that in this work he had made an absolutely new departure from his earlier operas and had kept to the most precise rhythmically dramatic declamation, which had certainly been made all the more easy for him by the excellent subject. Without being actually surprised, my horror was indeed great when, after studying not only the text, but also the score, I discovered that the old maestro had been absolutely mistaken in regard to the account he had given me of his work. The custom in force at that time that the decision concerning the production of work should not, as a rule, rest with one of the conductors alone, did not tend to make me any less fearful of declaring myself emphatically in favor of this work. In addition to this, it was Reisiger, who, as he had often boasted, was an old friend of Sparas, whose turn it was to select and produce a new work. Unfortunately, as I learned later, the general management had returned Sparas opera to its author in such a curt manner as to offend him, and he complained bitterly of this to me. Genuinely concerned at this, I had evidently managed to calm and appease him, for the invitation mentioned above was clearly a friendly acknowledgement of my efforts. He wrote that it was very painful for him to have to touch at Dresden on his way to one of the watering places, as, however, he had a real longing to make my acquaintance. He begged me to meet him in Leipzig, where he was going to stay for a few days. This meeting with him did not leave me unimpressed. He was a tall, stately man, distinguished in appearance, and of a serious and calm temperament. He gave me to understand, 
in a touching, almost apologetic manner, that the essence of his education and of his aversion from the new tendencies in music had its origin in the first impressions he had received on hearing, as a very young boy, Mozart's magic flute, a work which was quite new at that time and which had a great influence on his whole life. Regarding my libretto to Lohengrin, which I had left behind for him to read, and the general impression which my personal acquaintance had made on him, he expressed himself with almost surprising warmth to my brother-in-law, Hermann Brockhaus, at whose house we had been invited to dine, and where, during the meal, the conversation was most animated. Besides this, we had met at real musical evenings at the conductor Hauptmanns as well as at Mendelssohn's, on which occasion I heard the master take the violin in one of his own quartets. It was precisely in these circles that I was impressed by the touching and venerable dignity of his absolutely calm demeanor. Later on, I learned from witnesses for whose testimony, be it said, I cannot vouch that Tenuser, when it was performed at Castle, had caused him so much confusion and pain that he declared he could no longer follow me and feared that I must be on the wrong road. In order to recover from all the hardships and cares I had gone through, I now managed to obtain a special favor from the management in the form of a three months leave in which to improve my health in rustic retirement and to get pure air to breathe while composing some new work. To this end, I had chosen a peasant's house in the village of Grossgraupen, which is halfway between Pilnitz and the border of what is known as Saxon Switzerland. Frequent excursions to the Porsberg, to the adjacent Liebethaler, and to the far distant bastion helped to strengthen my unstrung nerves. While I was first planning the music to Lohengrin, I was disturbed incessantly by the echoes of some of the airs in Rossini's William Tell, which was the last opera I had had to conduct. At last I happened to hit on an effective means of stopping this annoying obtrusion. During my lonely walks I sang with great emphasis the first theme from the Ninth Symphony, which had also quite lately been revived in my memory. This succeeded. At Pirna, where one can bathe in the river, I was surprised, on one of my almost regular evening constitutionals, to hear the air from the pilgrimess chorus out of Tanuser whistled by some bather, who was invisible to me. This first sign of the possibility of popularizing the work, which I had with such difficulty succeeded in getting performed in Dresden, made an impression on me which no similar experience later on has ever been able to surpass. Sometimes I received visits from friends in Dresden, and among them Hans von Bülow, who was then sixteen years old, came accompanied by Lipinski. This gave me great pleasure, because I had already noticed the interest which he took in me. Generally, however, I had to rely only on my wife's company, and during my long walks I had to be satisfied with my little dog peps. During this summer holiday, of which a great part of the time had at the beginning to be devoted to the unpleasant task of arranging my business affairs, and also to the improvement of my health, I nevertheless succeeded in making a sketch of the music to the whole of the three acts of Lohengrin, although this cannot be said to have consisted of anything more than a very hasty outline. With this much gained, I returned in August to Dresden and resumed my duties as conductor, 
which every year seemed to become more and more burdensome to me. Moreover, I immediately plunged once more into the midst of troubles which had only just been temporarily allayed. The business of publishing my operas, on the success of which I still counted as the only means of liberating me from my difficult position, demanded ever fresh sacrifices if the enterprise were to be made worthwhile. But as my income was now very much reduced, even the smallest outlays necessarily led me into ever new and more painful complications, and I once more lost all courage. On the other hand, I tried to strengthen myself by again working energetically at Lohengrin. While doing this, I proceeded in a manner that I have not since repeated. I first of all completed the third act, and in view of the criticism already mentioned of the characters and conclusion of this act, I determined to try to make it the very pivot of the whole opera. I wish to do this, if only for the sake of the musical motive appearing in the story of the Holy Grail, but in other respects the plan struck me as perfectly satisfactory. Owing to previous suggestions on my part, Gluck as Iphigenia in Aulis was to be produced this winter. I felt it my duty to give more care and attention to this work, which interested me particularly on account of its subject, than I had given to the study of the Armida. In the first place, I was upset by the translation in which the opera with the Berlin score was presented to us. In order not to be led into false interpretations through the instrumental editions which I considered very badly applied in this score, I wrote for the original edition from Paris. When I had made a thorough revision of the translation, with a view merely to the correctness of declamation, I was spurred on by my increasing interest to revise the score itself. I tried to bring the poem as far as possible into agreement with Euripides' play of the same name by the elimination of everything which, in deference to French taste, made the relationship between Achilles and Iphigenia one of tender love. The chief alteration of all was to cut out the inevitable marriage at the end. For the sake of the vitality of the drama, I tried to join the arias and choruses, which generally followed immediately upon each other without rhyme or reason, by connecting links, prologues, and epilogues. In this I did my best, by the use of Gluckas themes, to make the interpolations of a strange composer as unnoticeable as possible. In the third act alone was I obliged to give Iphigenia, as well as Artemis, whom I had myself introduced, recitatives of my own composition. Throughout the rest of the work I revised the whole instrumentation more or less thoroughly, but only with the object of making the existing version produce the effect I desired. It was not till the end of the year that I was able to finish this tremendous task, and I had to postpone the completion of the third act of Lohengrin, which I had already begun, until the new year. The first thing to claim my attention at the beginning of the year, 1847, was the production of Iphigenia. I had to act as stage manager in this case, and was even obliged to help the scene painters and the mechanicians over the smallest details. Owing to the fact that the scenes in this opera were generally strung together somewhat clumsily and without any apparent connection, it was necessary to recast them completely, in order so to animate the representation as to give to the dramatic action the life it lacked. 
A good deal of this faultiness of construction seemed to me due to the many conventional practices which were prevalent at the Paris Opera in Gluck's time. Mitterwerzer was the only actor in the whole cast who gave me any pleasure. In the role of Agamemnon, he showed a thorough grasp of that character and carried out my instructions and suggestions to the letter, so that he succeeded in giving a really splendid and intelligent rendering of the part. The success of the whole performance was far beyond my expectations, and even the directors were so surprised at the exceptional enthusiasm aroused by one of Gluck's operas that for the second performance they, on their own initiative, had my name put on the program as reviser. This at once drew the attention of the critics to this work, and for once they almost did me justice. My treatment. Of the overture, the only part of the opera which these gentlemen heard rendered in the usual trivial way was the only thing that they could find fault with. I have discussed and given an accurate account of all that relates to this in a special article on Gluck's Overture to Iphigenia in Aulis, and I only wish to add here that the musician who made such strange comments on this occasion was Ferdinand Hiller. As in former years, the winter meetings of the various artistic elements in Dresden which Hiller had inaugurated continued to take place, but they now assumed more the character of salons in Hiller's own house, and it seemed to me intended solely for the purpose of laying the foundations for a general recognition of Hiller's artistic greatness. He had already found it, among the more wealthy patrons of art, the chief of whom was the banker Caskell, a society for running subscription concerts. As it was impossible for the Royal Orchestra to be placed at his disposal for this purpose, he had to content himself with members of the town and military bands for his orchestra, and it cannot be denied that, thanks to his perseverance, he attained a praiseworthy result. As he produced many compositions which were still unknown in Dresden, especially from the domain of more modern music, I was often tempted to go to his concerts. His chief bait to the general public, however, seemed to lie in the fact that he presented unknown singers, among whom, unfortunately, Jenny Lind was not to be found, and virtuosos, one of which, Joachim, who was then very young, I became acquainted with. Hilleras' treatment of those works with which I was already well acquainted showed what his musical power was really worth. The careless and indifferent manner in which he interpreted a triple concerto by Sebastian Bach positively astounded me. In the tempo di minuto of the Eighth Symphony of Beethoven, I found that Hilleras' rendering was even more astonishing than Reisiger's and Mendelssohn's. I promised to be present at the performance of this symphony if I could rely on his giving a correct rendering of the tempo of the third phrase, which was generally so painfully distorted. He assured me that he thoroughly agreed with me about it, and my disappointment at the performance was all the greater when I found the well-known waltz measure adopted again. When I called him to account about it, he excused himself with a smile, saying that he had been seized with a fit of temporary abstraction just at the beginning of the phrase in question, which had made him forget his promise. For inaugurating these concerts, which, as a matter of fact, only lasted for two seasons, Hiller was given a banquet, which I also had much pleasure in attending. People in these circles were surprised at that time to hear me speak, 
often with great animation, about Greek literature and history, but never about music. In the course of my reading, which I zealously pursued, and which drew me away from my professional activities to retirement and solitude, I was at that time impelled by my spiritual needs to turn my attention once more to a systematic study of this all-important source of culture. With the object of filling the perceptible gap between my boyhood's knowledge of the eternal elements of human culture and the neglect of this field of learning due to the life I had been obliged to lead. In order to approach the real goal of my desires, the study of Old and Middle High German in the right frame of mind, I began again from the beginning with Greek antiquity and was now filled with such overwhelming enthusiasm for this subject that, whenever I entered into conversation, and by hook or by crook had managed to get it round to this theme, I could only speak in terms of the strongest emotion. I occasionally met someone who seemed to listen to what I had to say. On the whole, however, people preferred to talk to me only about the theater because, since my production of Gluckas Iphigenia, they thought themselves justified in thinking I was an authority on this subject. I received special recognition from a man to whom I quite rightly gave the credit of being at least as well-versed as myself in the matter. This was Edouard de Vriant, who had been forced at that time to resign his position as stage manager-in-chief owing to a plot against him on the part of the actors, headed by his own brother Emile. We were brought into closer sympathy by our conversations in connection with this, which led him into dissertations on the triviality and thorough hopelessness of our whole theatrical life, especially under the ruining influence of ignorant court managers, which could never be overcome. We were also drawn together by his intelligent understanding of the part one had played in the production of Iphigenia, which he compared with the Berlin production of the same piece that had been utterly condemned by him. He was for a long time the only man with whom I could discuss, seriously and in detail, the real needs of the theater and the means by which its defects might be remedied. Owing to his longer and more specialized experience, there was much he could tell me and make clear to me. In particular, he helped me successfully to overcome the idea that mere literary excellence is enough for the theater and confirmed my conviction that the path to true prosperity lay only with the stage itself and with the actors of the drama. From this time forward, till I left Dresden, my intercourse with Edouard de Vriant grew more and more friendly, though his dry nature and obvious limitations as an actor had attracted me but little before. His highly meritorious work, Digestik der Deutschen Schauspielkunst, History of German Dramatic Art, which he finished and published about that time, threw a fresh and instructive light on many problems which exercise my mind and helped me to master them for the first time. At last I managed once more to resume my task of composing the third act of Lohengrin, which had been interrupted in the middle of the bridal scene, and I finished it by the end of the winter. After the repetition, by special request, of the Ninth Symphony at the concert on Palm Sunday had revived me, I tried to find comfort and refreshment for the further progress of my new work by changing my abode, this time without asking permission. The old Marcolini Palace, with a very large garden laid out partly in the French style, 
was situated in an outlying and thinly populated suburb of Dresden. It had been sold to the town council, and a part of it was to be let. The sculptor, H. Nell, whom I had known for a long time and who had given me as a mark of friendship an ornament in the shape of a perfect plaster cast of one of the bar reliefs from Beethoven's monument representing the Ninth Symphony, had taken the large rooms on the ground floor of a side wing of this palace for his dwelling and studio. At Easter I moved into the spacious apartments above him, the rent of which was extremely low, and found that the large garden planted with glorious trees, which was placed at my disposal, and the pleasant stillness of the whole place, not only provided mental food for the weary artist, but at the same time, by lessening my expenses, improved my straightened finances. We soon settled down quite comfortably in the long row of pleasant rooms without having incurred any unnecessary expense, as Minna was very practical in her arrangements. The only real inconvenience which, in the course of time, I found our new home possessed was its inordinate distance from the theater. This was a great trial to me after fatiguing rehearsals and tiring performances, as the expense of a cab was a serious consideration. But we were favored by an exceptionally fine summer, which put me in a happy frame of mind and soon helped to overcome every inconvenience. At this time, I insisted with the utmost firmness on refraining from taking any further share in the management of the theater, and I had most cogent reasons to bring forth in defense of my conduct. All my endeavors to set in order the willful chaos which prevailed in the use of the costly artistic materials at the disposal of this royal institution were repeatedly thwarted, merely because I wished to introduce some method into the arrangements. In a carefully written pamphlet which, in addition to my other work, I had compiled during the past winter, I had drawn up a plan for the reorganization of the orchestra and had shown how we might increase the productive power of our artistic capital by making a more methodical use of the royal funds intended for its maintenance and showing greater discretion regarding salaries. This increase in the productive power would raise the artistic spirit as well as improve the economic position of the members of the orchestra, for I should have liked them at the same time to form an independent concert society. In such a capacity, it would have been their task to present to the people of Dresden, in the best possible way, a kind of music which they had hitherto hardly had the opportunity of enjoying at all. It would have been possible for such a union, which, as I pointed out, had so many external circumstances in its favor, to provide Dresden with a suitable concert hall. I hear, however, that such a place is wanting to this day. With this object in view, I entered into close communication with architects and builders, and the plans were completed, according to which the scandalous buildings facing a wing of the renowned prison opposite the Ostrali, and consisting of a shed for the members of the theater and a public washhouse, were to be pulled down and replaced by a beautiful building, which, besides containing a large concert hall adapted to our requirements, would also have had other large rooms which could have been let out on hire at a profit. The practicality of these plans was disputed by no one, 
as even the administrators of the Orchestra's Widows Fund saw in them an opportunity for the safe and advantageous laying out of capital, yet they were returned to me, after long consideration on the part of the general management, with thanks and an acknowledgement of my careful work, and the curt reply that it was thought better for things to remain as they were.